you for joining us to explore the topic of slavery in Canada. I know that we are all going to learn new things. We may have assumptions cracked open, um, but I think we'll also be uplifted by the caliber and creativity of the research uh, being done in this important area of inquiry. I'll begin with a land acknowledgement. The McMichael Canadian Art Collection is located on the original lands of the Ojibwe and Anishinaabe people. It is uniquely situated along the Carrying Place Trail, which historically provided an integral connection for Indigenous people between Ontario's lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay region. As an institution, the McMichael recognizes the importance of acknowledging the original territories of the Ojibwe and Anishinaabe First Nations people and other Indigenous nations. Furthermore, and especially relevant to tonight's conversation, the McMichael recognizes that 2021 falls within the international decade of pe for people of African descent as proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly. This proclamation calls on the international community to recognize that people of African des descent are a distinct group who, uh, whose human rights must be promoted and protected. In particular, we must remember the millions of Africans who were stolen from their homeland, who lost their lives on that journey, those who suffered and died in the fight for freedom, and those who continue to suffer and die from the effects of anti-Black racism in its many manifestations. We recognize those who continue to challenge anti-Black racism and seek to make a contribution to that effort with this conversation tonight. I'll quickly cover a few basics of our format. Um, firstly, this talk is being recorded. So if you're thinking of a friend or family member who would have loved to have been with us tonight, uh, please look for a link to the recording on our YouTube channel in the coming days. Secondly, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please use it. Uh, we have some time reserved at the end for questions. Um, thirdly, I'll say that the occasion of this talk is um, connected to the opening of an exhibition on the artist Denise Tomasos, which we had been hoping to open in February of this year uh, to coincide with Black History Month. Um, but due to the COVID-19 shutdown in Ontario, we've had to reschedule. The show is being installed this week so that it will be ready for our first visitors just as soon as we uh, get the green light to open again. So please cross your fingers that it will be soon. Just before we start, I'd like to say that our discussion tonight will include descriptions of harm and suffering. Um, these are inextricable from the topic at hand and will at times surely be difficult to hear. Um, but without these difficult details, we just can't fully engage uh, with the history of transatlantic slavery. And in fact, a, a history of unwillingness to hear these difficult details goes right to the heart of our discussion tonight. Um, but viewer and listener, listener discretion uh, is advised. With that, uh, let's begin tonight's program. Um, McMichael Chief Curator Sarah Milroy in conversation with Gitan Verna, uh, Director of the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery in Toronto, and Dr. Charmaine Nelson, Professor of Art History, a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair, and the Founding Director of the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery at NASCAD, of Canadian Slavery at NASCAD University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan, and I'm so delighted to have Char Charmaine and Gaetan uh, both with us tonight. Gaetan and I had uh, the best day ever. Um, plunging into, let's take a look, uh, uh, Charmaine, at that painting, um, Odyssey, which is just entering our collection at the, at the McMichael. Um, we were plunged into the world of Denise Tomasos, uh, looking at these beautiful paintings in the flesh. And as Jen mentioned, the show is going to open hopefully in early June when we're able to open to the public again. But, you know, the visceral power of these paintings was just, you know, extraordinary to experience. And, um, you know, it, it, it is so important that we understand more fully uh, the deep history that lies behind the force of these works. And that's exactly what uh, uh, Charmaine Nelson's gonna help us with um, tonight through her extensive research, as Jen said, on the history of transatlantic slavery and, and it's the, the presence of those histories in Canada. And you know, we had a meeting a, a couple of days ago and I actually made Charmaine laugh a little about this idea that Settler Canadians tend to be kind of virgins when it comes to our complicity in slavery. We like to think of ourselves very much as a country that does not have, you know, a role, did not have a role to play in, in slavery, and also that we are the end of the Underground Railroad. So, you know, we're the land of milk and honey. And of course, you know, this, this is not the case, but, you know, I had a 
the, the sort of sense of the moment that we're in was really heightened this morning. I have a very bad habit of reading emails before I get out of bed in the morning. And the email that I opened first this morning was from a gallery in Montreal called Projet Pangé. And it was a work by um, an artist named Erika, Je Erika Jones. And um, Charmaine, if you could show us that. Or, or Erika James, sorry, James. Um, this is a work uh, that the show I think just opened today and it's installed in the gallery. Uh, it's, it's funny, it's just a twist of fate that it's installed with a little chandelier above it, but it really, um, this is how they sent out the image and it really struck me this kind of, you know, what is it that underlies the, the, the luxury of uh, settler people in the new world. Um, it got me thinking, if we could look at the next slide, about other works that I've seen recently that have really struck me on the subject of um, enslaved people in the New World. This is um, uh, Pervai and Turner's uh, Bell from the Wanted series that our, our very good colleagues at the Archaeology of Ontario presented as part of the sesquicentennial uh, back in 2017, a spectacular uh, work of contemporary art that really uh, responds to the um, fugitive slave ads that were run in, in uh, Canadian newspapers um, during the historical period that Charmaine will be dealing with tonight. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Here's Camille Turner has also continued to be looking carefully at the role of Newfoundland in building uh, slave ships. This is not a, this is sort of a subject that she stumbled into and is now utterly absorbed by and continues to make um, more exhibitions and learning opportunities for the public through her Afronautics uh, Research Lab. And um, last slide here, one more with Esma Muhammad. Um, again, this is an artist whose work we are about to bring into the um, McMichael Canadian Art Collection, and we're delighted about that. Here are the, uh, the you know, figures in chains. She's making a very complex point about uh, bodies in athletics, uh, professional sports versus the enslaved and persecuted bodies of, in, involved in slavery. Um, very, very powerful work. And finally, Chantal Gibson, um, this marvelous historical interventions. I felt sort of a lightning tour of contemporary art that <laughs> pertains to the history of slavery, but I felt like this was the perfect jumping off point um, for Charmaine tonight, uh, because it is really about re rewriting the history of Canada. And again, um, Charmaine, uh, Gaetan and I are both so, so grateful for you making the time to be with us tonight. And we look so much forward to hearing your research. And then at the end of our talk, spending some time looking uh, through new eyes at the work of Denise Tomasos that we've gathered uh, for, together at the end of this talk. So take it away, Charmaine, and again, our thanks. Thank you. And thank you so much, Sarah, for your generous invitation. It's really wonderful to be here. I'll just stress again that um, uh, this work is very difficult to, to study. Um, and so I know many of us in Canada uh, have not had the opportunity to learn anything about transatlantic slavery, much more Canadian slavery. So please breathe through this because this, this, this is very difficult subject matter. Also, I'll just warn you that I'll use some of the colonial racial terms like Negro and mulatto that we find in the archives. Uh, and this is because I do this uh, strategically because um, Canadians, uh, we really need a reckoning with the fact that these histories are our own and not Caribbean or American uh, imports. So we begin. I begin with this quote from the scholar of uh, slavery, Caribbean slavery, Hillary Mc McDaniel Beckles. Um, about the power of slave owners. And I'll quote, neither colonial statutes or slave codes then invested slaves with any rights over their own bodies, but rather transferred and consolidated such rights within the legal person of the slave owners. This direct translation of legal entitlement into social power and authority meant that white men especially were located at a convergence where the racial, sexual and class domination of slave women provided a totality of terror and tyranny. And this applies too to white female slave owners of both uh, enslaved females and males, okay, including children. So just the scope of transatlantic slavery, what are we talking about? Britain, Denmark and Norway, commonly forgotten as well, France, Portugal, Spain and Netherlands, the empire builders in the Americas, 400 years in duration from the 1400s until the 1800s, and Cuba and Brazil almost took transatlantic slavery into the 20th century. We need to think about that. Now, what did it entail? Only Black Africans were deemed to be always enslavable, 
4 million people died on the forced marches to the West African, West African coast. That is died before ever making it onto a slave ship, but were intended to go onto the slave ship. 2 million died on board at sea in what we now call the Middle Passage from illness, corporal punishment, um, murder, and suicide, right? Resistance through killing yourself because you mu must imagine that these enslaved people didn't know where they were going, why they were going there, and what awaited them in the Americas. So they were being terrorized and they were terrified. 12.5 million people survived the Middle Passage that is made it off the slave ships on the other side in the Americas and were scattered where? From Argentina to Canada and the Caribbean and some were forced back to Europe. We rarely talk about those enslaved people who were forced to go to Europe with their slave owners. So these 12.5 million people and their descendants are who we now refer to today as the Black Diaspora, people who were forcibly dispersed and removed from Africa. In Canada, we're talking about two empires, Britain and France, a 200 year scope, 1600s until 1834. 1807 is when the British abolished the slave trade. They said you can no longer go back to Africa to get new enslaved people. But slavery was still legal until 1834 when they abolished it by an act of parliament in London. At that point, we as people who were loyal to the British crown were also forced to stop slaving. So our end date is 1834 because the British mandated that. Now the slave owners in, British, uh, in the em British Empire in tropical locations like Jamaica, Antigua, Barbados, Trinidad were paid for every enslaved person that they quote unquote lost. S enslaved people got nothing, okay? So the regional scope in Canada, we're talking about Ontario eastward, Ontario to Newfoundland. That does not mean that enslaved people were not taken west of Ontario, it means they were, they were taken there at the point where those regions were not yet provinces. Hmm. So things for contemplation, number one, how were Europeans and Euro-Americans transformed by 400 year practice of racial hatred, violence, and white superiority? We rarely think about the impact on the white psyche and white society of this brutality. What was the so social, psychological, and psychic toll on whites? To, to practice this heinous institution for 400 years? What did that do to white people? Number two, what types of transgenerational harm, biological, physical, social, psychological, were inflicted upon black people, upon black populations? And how does ongoing anti-black racism still create trauma for black people, individual and community today? And number three, what steps are needed to acknowledge, to redress, to heal these histories of racist inequity, brutality, suffering, and genocide. So of course, what a lot of people do not understand, because art historians are not usually at the table in the study of transatlantic slavery, it's mainly historians, but that there is a 400 year archive of art and visual culture that was created alongside slavery, much of it what we call pro-slavery to justify the enslavement of black Africans. So the first image, of course, is enslaved people um, being marched to the coast. There were also um, dungeons or what were referred to as castles, but there were fortress fortresses governed by different European nations on the west coast of Africa, where enslaved people captives would be held prior to being put on the slave ships. And of course, um, enslaved people were uh, forced to submit to pseudo-medical, pseudo-scientific inspections because the state of medicine, of course, was not what it was today. And you see here a black man in the center having his, his being held down, pinned down, and his mouth being forced open. Now, these type of inspections were not for the benefit of the enslaved captives. They were for the benefit of the slave ship owner and the slave ship captain, because what they were trying to do is assess if someone was sick and then to make sure they didn't go on the ship because the nature of the confinement in the cargo hold of the ship meant that any type of disease would spread um, very quickly through the enslaved captives. Now, I must point out too, in this 400 year archive, there's also abolitionists or anti-slavery groups working um, and often with the visual culture, popular mass produced culture to try to dissuade the public 
um, to support slavery or to turn people against slavery. This is a very famous cross section of a slave ship. And every black mark that you see in this cross section, they're showing you the cargo hold. The black marks are actually enslaved captives, tight packed into the cargo hold. So what we're talking about here then is typically people went on the ship naked or with maybe a loincloth and no possessions. Men were often shackled and held in one part of the um, cargo hold and women separated and segregated into another. Children sometimes would sleep, for instance, in the captain's cabin. This was done to strategically to terrorize the women and the children to teach the men then that they had no control over the protection of their community and kin on board. And I should say, in very difficult subject, but we know that slave ship crews did rape and sexually violate enslaved females on board those ships. And we've, of course, um, you know, inherited the actual um, physical technologies of brutality and immobilization too, which are today some, um, some artifacts in our museums in Europe and other parts of the world. So in terms of the nature of transatlantic slavery, what are we talking about? Number one, we have to get that this was the first race-based slavery ever. Okay, so, you know, many people say, well, we've always had slavery. What's the difference with transatlantic slavery? Slavery is bad in general. Well, this, my friends, was the first time that concepts of, concepts of whiteness, blackness, so-called Indianness and Asianness were created in and through slavery in a hierarchy, which always placed white people or Europeans at the top of that hierarchy. And this became pervasive then in both popular culture, in arts, and in so-called scientific common sense. And this also is seen then in the racist imagery of the pseudoscientists. And I say pseudoscientists because many of these today, like craniology, phrenology, eugenics, have been um, debunked. Okay, so here you can see here that also what's interesting in this hierarchy with white men at the top that the white man is resistant to any type of scientific uh, gaze because standing in for the white man is an antique sculpture, the Apollo Belvedere. In the middle is the so-called Negro or Negroid. And of course, what this is meant to, to do is show the black person's proximity to simians or apes, in this case, chimpanzees. Okay, so there's a plethora of this racist imagery. And at the time, what today we consider students, pseudosciences were of course considered sciences, legitimate sciences. Number two, under colonial laws, slaves, or to be a slave was initially to be considered cargo on the slave ship. And then eventually under the law in the Americas, you would be considered movable personal property, like a chair, like a cart, like a bag of salt, or another word for that is chattel. Enslaved people had no control over their own lives or that of their children or kin. And their devaluation as um, subhuman then led to extreme forms of brutality and corporal punishment, also psychological control, torture, and um, surveillance. This is what's led the scholar of Jamaican slavery, Trevor Bernard, to characterize slavery as, um, or the lives of the enslaved, as living in states of radical uncertainty. Because to be enslaved was to never know where the next blow, where the next form of punishment was coming from. Would it come from fellow enslaved people? Would it come from the, from the master or the mistress? And to have no control over your life in that capacity um, as well. So to show the objectification here, an example from Canada, we have an auction ad from Nova Scotia. And you can see here, a Negro man, this means a black man, and slave man being auctioned from um, the late Mr. Joseph Pierpoint's um, um, wharf in the 18th century. Now, what's really horrific about this is, of course, this man was being sold with horses, with uh, fishing nets, with salmon, with all these other inanimate objects, and the auctioneers and the owner of this man did not even see fit to list his name. Okay, so I want us to contemplate here the objectification of enslaved people. Of course, too, we've inherited a plethora of images of the technologies of torture, immobilization, and abuse. In this case, we have um, a man who's been muzzled. This was probably uh, was most often used when you're trying to stop someone eating. So a form of punishment would be to prohibit someone from being able to eat. And then the heavy weight that shackled to him was to prohibit him from running. So often this was a type of punishment inflicted upon people who resisted through flight. We also have still 
some of the um, actual implements of torture themselves. And in a case like this, again, this would be a typical collar placed on someone who ran away because of course uh, the prongs would prohibit you from moving through dense vegetation and the bells obviously would signal that you were running, right? You, they, they would ring every time you moved. Here you see different types of shackles and also thumb screws and the pincers were used to pry people's mouths open to force feed them. So some enslaved people we know resisted by trying to not eat so that they could die. And even in those cases, of course, your body was not considered to be your own. You were the possession of your slave owner. So often slave owners and their servants like overseers would force feed the enslaved people. And this are um, some uh, a preserved object of the, the thumb screws here that were used to torture people. And the infamous cat of nine tails, a type of whip. And I should point out that the whips that were used on enslaved people were the same ones that were used on um, cattle, horses, mules, etc. No different than that used on um, livestock. Branding, of course, was practiced prolifically in the um, American South in the Caribbean and also in South America. And we have to think about the type of impunity with which slave owners were functioning because of course they did not fear advertising that they had branded people when they were hunting for them. Uh, this is a fugitive slave ad for an enslaved man named George who's run away. And in Jamaica, uh, the slave owner Hyman was unafraid to actually print that he had inflicted uh, terrible harm on this man by branding him. And here I just wanted to show you the enslaved child at the right as, as being humiliated with the collar that he's being forced to wear in this, uh, in this context, in this elite or likely aristocratic household. So number three, transatlantic slavery was deliberately structured in what we call a matrilineal order. This is so important. Why? Any child born to an enslaved female because that woman or that girl was enslaved, the child was born enslaved and owned by the person who owned the female. So what did this do? It incentivized rape and sexual coercion because slave owners understood that to impregnate that female, regardless of the status or the race of the father, was to get yourself a new unit of labor, a new so-called slave. So that is why then you have an explosion of mixed race people who are enslaved because their mothers were enslaved. And you have the creation of this uh, colonial nomenclature, mulatto, meaning mixed, meaning one white father, uh, one white, white parent, one black parent, quadroon, octroon, et cetera, okay? And these terms were designed to track blackness as a supposed pathology in the person, okay? So another way that breeding came uh, became practiced, and I literally do mean breeding, and slave owners would force to enslave people to couple sexually across sometimes years of their fertile lives. Uh, in this case, we have a Jamaican planter, Matthew Lewis, who kept a breeding list, meaning he was invasively monitoring the fertility and sexual health of the enslaved women on his property and coercing them to have children. How? He'd reward them with a red girdle and silver coins for every child that they would bear for him, understanding that their children were actually his property. So the nature of the sources that we use to learn about slavery uh, are typically either manuscript, meaning handwritten, often one of a kind documents, like those listed here, or printed materials like the ads that I'm, I'm going to be showing you, or also don't forget the art and the visual culture, really central. And again, there's a 400 year archive of the art and visual culture from all of the different empires and the, their colonies that I've pointed out. So um, these documents are very interesting and really horrific and difficult to, to comprehend that we did this to each other for 400 years. This is a plantation ledger, typically planters in places like the Caribbean, the American South, think a country like Brazil, would draw these up January 1st and do a head count of their livestock. To the planter, that included human beings, the Black Africans that they enslaved. Now. In terms of the objectification, you typically only ever get a first name. Why? Because the last name was the name of the person who owned you. That is why we have people in a place like Jamaican Barbados with 
English last name. In Brazil, you have Black populations with Portuguese last names. In the Dominican Republic, Spanish last names. Because the last names of our ancestors were stripped, the African names and the white name of the European owner imposed. And these ledgers can be actually quite vast because in a place like Jamaica, typically you'd have plantations thousands of acres in size with hundreds of enslaved people on each. Often I wanna point out here too, the A's and the C's, what they're tracking here is who was African born and who is Creole. Creole being a term meaning any person born in the Americas. It wasn't a racially specific term in the transatlantic world, in the Anglophone world. So why are they doing this? Because planters rightfully acknowledged that people who were African born typically were more resistant. Why? Because they remembered being free. They remembered another life. So they were monitoring how many Africans were held on each plantation because plantations typically with too many Africans experienced rebellions. Okay, you can see the ages here are mere guesswork in many cases. Because if the enslaved person wasn't born to you in your, as one of your holdings, then you're buying them off the slave ship or through a third party who typically didn't know how old they were either. And from these uh, types of documents, we can ascertain when enslaved children started to be assigned jobs. And uh, what we've determined is usually around the age of four to six as an enslaved child, you had a job. Right? In this case, they were assigned to a weeding gang on this plantation. In Canada, uh, signs of the same objectification, we have the slave sale ads, and they're exactly what it sounds like. These are a mechanism printed by the slave owners in newspapers, Canadian newspapers, to sell human beings. Now, what characterizes these are typically you get no name. Names were not deemed necessary. You get a racial type here, a Negro boy. Sometimes you get an, an age and often you get that they're obedient, healthy, and what types of labor you can get from them. So they're typically quite bereft of details. Now I want you to think about the fact too that those children were being sold by themselves. Where are their parents? Where are their kins? Where are their, um, where are their kin? Where are their communities? The slave owners did not care. They did not care. These children are being circulated and separated from their family. That's normal in slavery. Here, another document that we come up with a lot um, that we can find in the archive or manuscript document, bills of sale. And you'll find these again across the transatlantic world. This one from Halifax with a woman, enslaved black woman named Dinah being sold. And note that one of the people here is a minister of the Christian church. And of course, many Christians were abolitionists and many others were slave owners and pro-slavery advocates. Another type of really shocking document if you don't study slavery is will and estate inventories are very useful to us. Why? Enslaved people again were considered chattel or movable personal property. That meant that if the slave owner died before the enslaved person and if they were wealthy enough to leave a will, then the enslaved person was handed down and either sold out of the will or passed down to an heir through the mechanism of the will. So in this case, we have Thursday, a black girl being sold to John Bishop out of her initial slave owner, John Rock's will. And we have her evaluation here, or sorry, the sale price at 20 pounds. Now, I want us to think briefly about what happens to different genres of art under the pressure of slavery in terms of how black and slave people were represented in very distinct ways from white, especially upper-class people. So if you think about the, the, the genre of portraiture, for instance, here we have two upper-class white people in the context of the province of Quebec. They, as the sitters, were the patrons of their own likenesses. They were the ones who paid Bocour to represent them. In the end, were able to dictate to him that they look a certain way, meaning, quote, unquote, good. Make me look good. Make this flattering. When we have the enslaved woman on the right, who now we've recuperated her name, we believe her to be Marie Therese Mir, portraiture is completely turned on his head, more so because Bukor, we believe, and his white wife owned Marie. Therefore, she was not the patron of her own likeness. And her smiling face then and her exposed breasts, her what we'd call hypersexualization, has nothing to do with her own desires. She would not have had um, the wealth nor a private residence in which to display the portrait. 
and she would not have even been paid as a model. Bukor, as her owner, could have dictated to her, get yourself to my studio, dress in this way, expose yourself to me, I'm going to paint you. So what we need to do when we look at this painting of Marie is understand it as recording the violence of her enslavement by the artist who also owned her. This has nothing to do with what she actually quote unquote looked like. It has everything to do with what he imagined her to be and her hypersexualization then her offering of her body juxtaposed with that tray of tropical fruit is about his white male heterosexual imagination and stigmatization of her black female sexuality as a person that he owned. And you can see in this other juxtaposition how stark the differences are between how he represented white people and how he represented Marie. So when we're thinking about Canadian slavery, we're not thinking about this. It was not tropical. We could not sustain a plantation economy all year round. So there's quite a few things that were distinct. So we're again, thinking about Ontario eastward to Newfoundland. And what I wanna do is to push us to think about what we've typically done in this nation, which is to enshrine and to pat ourselves on the back for the mm -hmm. Underground Railroad which is three decades, my friends. Underground Railroad was 1834, the end of the British uh, practice of transatlantic slavery, to 1865, the end of the American Civil War. Is that those 31 years when enslaved African Americans were fleeing north into Canada? Prior to that, we were slaving for 200 years. We don't teach the 200 years at any level of our curriculum. Not in elementary school, not in high school, not in stage up in Quebec, not in university. So what does that say about what we've done to our colonial histories in terms of what we have been willing to face? So we literally take ourselves off the maps of slavery and outside and put ourselves outside of the histories. On this map, for instance, there should be trade routes going up from the Caribbean to ports like what? Halifax, Quebec City, Montreal. Why is that important? Uh, I'll get to some imagery on that in a second, but in terms of specificity of Canadian slavery, just wanted to highlight a couple of things. Climate, of course, different, drastic seasonal, seasonal shifts, cold winters. We could not sustain a plantation economy. Doesn't mean we are better, kinder, gentler slave owners. We didn't do it because we couldn't do it, okay? That's why there were less enslaved people in Canada, not because there was more benevolence amongst the slave owning classes. Number two, enslaved people were forced to live in the homes or in a lesser building in the, in a prop, on the property of their slave owners. And typically we're talking about one or two enslaved people at a time owned by a couple, a family or an individual. Number three, the small size of the enslaved black population and the nature of their living then meant that it would have been extraordinarily different, difficult for them to maintain their African and African Creole cultures. How did they congregate? Were they allowed to congregate, to practice their musical culture, to their orality, their singing, to bury their dead they wanted the way they wanted to do that, to dress the way they wanted to do, remembering Africa? Were they able to do that? How were they able to do that? We still need to research that quite a bit. Number four, most enslaved people lived in urban areas. This is completely different from, think of the American South, Jamaica, Haiti, where you flip that, it's about the plantation, it's about rurality. In Canada, most enslaved people, for instance, Quebec, the province, were living in Quebec City first, Montreal second, and then the rest of the province. Number five, enslaved often did not, uh, or sorry, did a combination of both domestic and outdoor labor. So you as that one or two enslaved people of those, those one or two people in, your in that household, you did whatever the slave master or mistress told you to do. One day is take care of the kid, next day is churn the butter, then milk the cow, then go outside and cut the wood. You do what they tell you to do, which is multifaceted and not limited to then a specialization as we see in places like Jamaica where your job day in, day out might've been to work with sugarcane. Number six, white slave owners were both middle and upper class, males and females. Um, so typically we think in slave, own slave owners were always rich, not so. Indeed, governors in Canada owned enslaved people, but also merchants, butchers, tailors, lawyers, soldiers. And in Quebec also, what's unique about the province of Quebec and New France before it under the French, 
both indigenous and black people were being enslaved. And lastly, extraordinary, extraordinary heterogeneity of what blackness was uh, in terms of enslaved and free black people historically in Canada. African Canadian, African American, African Anglo and Franco Caribbean, and people from elsewhere in the Americas. And on top of that, the minority within the minority, enslaved Africans born on the continent, African born people. So a person like James McGill, I just wanna shake you up here a bit. We usually revere him as a great philanthropist, founder of McGill University that's celebrating their 200th year anniversary this year. And we only like to remember him as a fur trader. Not true. He was also what was called a West Indian merchant, meaning that he was bringing in uh, tropical slave produced crops from places like Jamaica, Barbados, Antigua, et cetera. So he not only enslaved indigenous and black people in Montreal, he also was uh, exploiting slave labor in places like Jamaica. And evidence of this is of course, again, uh, available to us in the newspapers. When we look at the ships moving between Canadian and Caribbean ports. We look at the old Jamaican rum being sold by someone like Andrew McGill in Halifax and the sugar being sold again by other merchants in a place like Halifax and the trade in human beings. Here's the merchant Joshua Major selling six enslaved who, people he's calling Creoles. And in, in Halifax, I should point out Creole meant Caribbean born. So he's advertising to us that this shipment of black people has come in from the Caribbean. I'd like to point out too, that it's highly likely that these six people were not related at all. That the 12 and 13 year old boys are being again, sold on their own, sold away from family and kin. And that none of these people are um, a community, so to speak. So here, just look briefly at the racial terminology that emerged. Of course, it's denser in tropical locations of plantation slavery. Jamaica had a six tier naming practice. What you find in a place like Quebec is Negro, Negro mulatto and mulatto when you're talking about black people. And when you're talking about indigenous people, they had the term Pawnee for males and Pawnees for females. And that's a term, of course, that did not pay any attention to the specific ethnicity or nation of the indigenous people. Now, today, thankfully, we've moved on to, um, you know, different uh, naming practices. Some are um, practices that combine your racial uh, designation with national a designation like African Canadian, for instance, European Canadian and others like Jamaican Canadian, Haitian American um, are not a racial designation at all because of course a Jamaican Canadian could be an Asian person, for instance. And then of course, terms like black, white, Asian, indigenous. Now, I'll just let you look at this. I know I can't go through all of it. I don't tend to go through all of it, but I'll just, I'll sum up now. I know I'm running out of time by looking at a couple of these. And this is the, the elements of slave over owner control which was basically, think about it and uh, think about it this way. Uh, instead of me talking about what slave owners controlled, um, they controlled everything, everything about the enslaved. Because again, you were an object considered chattel under the law. And that meant too, that you did not have the right in most colonial jurisdictions to rep your, represent yourself before a court of law, to bring a case, let's say um, uh, on behalf of yourself, if your slave owner was abusing you viciously in terms of corporal punishment, you weren't allowed to bring that case to a court of law because you were not considered a human, so you could not petition the court. So just to break down a couple of these for you, place of residence. In the plantation locations of tropical slavery, typically you actually have so-called Negro villages or slave quarters because again, there's hundreds of enslaved people on the one plantation that might be thousands of acres in size. In Canada, again, not so. We have enslaved people forced to live in the homes of the slave owners. So think about the incessant surveillance under which they live. In this case, um, I show you here a fugitive slave ad for a woman named Chloe who escaped from her slave owner, Judah Joseph, in the province of Quebec. What's fascinating here is that um, the nature of Judge Joseph's description tells us that Chloe had to escape from where she was being held, 
which was his home. And she did so by placing a ladder against the house. She's escaping, of course, from um, an upper story window. That's why she needed the ladder. And what's remarkable here too, is we see the nature of her very sophisticated plan because there was a man waiting for her on the river in a canoe. So often too, what's brilliant about these fugitive slave ads, horrific in intent, but what's wonderful is that the slave owners are so desperate to get the enslaved person back that they often revealed things about the enslaved, their intellect, their intelligence, their sophisticated reasoning, things that the slave owner denied that they possessed in the first place, which is why the slave owner insisted that they needed to be enslaved. But because they were so desperate to get the enslaved person back, often then they're exposing things about them like their intelligence. In the tropical regions here, I just want to point out that the big house on the hill is typically where the um, slave master and mistress would live. In the American South, it was called the big house. In a place like Jamaica, it was called the great house. And where the, the Negro village would have been is down below in the trees. And so surveillance here, what I want to point out is that surveillance was built into the architectural landscape of the plantation. Why do this? So that you could watch the enslaved people. And even when you weren't watching them, they would feel as if they were being watched. So a mechanism to stop them from resisting through flight and resisting in other ways. In terms of the immobilization of enslaved people um, and the control of their movement, you find in Quebec, for instance, the period of the Revolutionary War, um, ads like this, which actually detail the fact that this enslaved woman had been forced up from New York by this loyalist who then turns around and sells her in Quebec. So again, who did she leave behind? Who was she forced to leave behind? Because he decided who he would take with him and who would be left. That was his power and his control. And just a couple more and then I'll end there, Sarah, and hand it back to you. In terms of mobility and passes, here we have um, beautiful signs of resistance of enslaved people. You have Andrew, who is escaping from the Montreal vintner James Crofton, and Crofton takes a step to say that he thinks he has Andrew, that is, forged certificates of his freedom and passes. So what does this tell us? It tells us that there's a network that is helping enslaved people to produce passes. And what passes were, were what they sound like, a piece of paper, either handwritten or typeset, which would state where that enslaved person was allowed to go in a certain period of time for the slave owner. Think about that. So your mobility on a day-to-day -day basis is so controlled by the slave owner that they'd give you a piece of paper that would state the two points between which you were allowed to move. Now, why you needed that pass too is that any white person felt entitled to stop you and question you about where you were going if you were a black person who they thought was an enslaved person. That's another thing we have to understand about the logic of passes. And of course we have some extent um, uh, details, sometimes fragments or entire passes that have still survived. In this case too, in terms of immobilization, we have Joe escaping from a jail. Why? Joe had escaped his slave owner who was the owner of the Quebec Gazette, the printer William Brown. And where we find Joe initially upon that escape is locked up in jail. Why? Because the owners had an expectation that the state would help them to capture or recapture that enslaved person. So this, what we're experiencing now in terms of anti-Black racism and the role of the police in the, the you know, profiling and over-policing and police brutality and sometimes execution of Black people dates back, of course, to the period of slavery. But remarkably here, Joe breaks out of jail with a white criminal named John Peters. We know he's white because they don't say he's white, right? At this per period in Canadian history, they're naming only non-white people, whereas Joe is named, of course, as a Negro man. And what is unusual here and important to note is that James Shepard, the sheriff, and John Hill, the jailkeeper, are the ones placing this ad. William Brown also places one later, but it is the sheriff and the jailer who feel that it's their job to hunt for Joe, at least initially. So Sarah, I'll throw it back to you. Do you want me to stop sharing now? Uh, no, I, I was going to ask you to keep advancing the slides for us because um, oh yeah, 
Okay. I'm going to require your assistance here as we as we move forward into talking about uh, Denise Tomasos's paintings when, when we get sure, there. Sure, 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 sure. So I'll go forward to, do you want me to go forward to where Denise will be? Yeah, and it's, sure. um, you know, I think that, you know, what I find myself thinking, and Gaetan, I'm sure you feel the same, is, you know, how much Denise would have enjoyed hearing, um, enjoyed is perhaps the wrong word, but how meaningful it would have been for her to um, hear your, your words tonight because she was such an incredible um, autodidact and was so voracious in her understanding and her, her constant questing, not only in research, but also her travels around the world to try and understand these histories better. And, you know, I had a, a question that came up in my mind um, and I don't know if you have an answer for it, but do you have a sense of how many people lived as enslaved people over the period of time that you're covering here in Canada specifically? Mm -hmm. I think it, yeah, oh. I think it, thanks for that, Sarah. I think it likely would have been, um, um, if we, we have the whole scope of the, of the 200 years, so 1600 to 1834, mm -hmm. and all of those different um, like regions or that become provinces, um, and the French and the British Empire, I think we're going to be dealing with tens of thousands of people by the end. So this is uh, the, one of the most explicit pieces that Denise made about the history of the transatlantic slave trade. And maybe, Gaetan, you can open up the title of this work and, and what it's like to stand in front of this thing as we did today. Yes, I think that um, um, really the everything when one looks at Denise's work, and of course, you know, um, many people when looking at Denise Tomas's work will comment the fact that there's a grid that is a repeating motif architectural grid. And uh, automatically people are gonna think about the modernist grid that, you know, in, uh, that is often seen in works of artists, you know, from the 1960s conceptual art, but one must always remember with Denise that it is not about the modernist grid. It really is about uh, the architecture of confinement of slave uh, cargo ships. Um, she, the, um, the image that you showed uh, Charmaine of mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the structure of, of uh, the boat, she was really obsessed with, you know, all of these architectural documents. Um, and um, when we look at a work like this piece, which at one point, you know, we in our research, we find it mentioned as displays burial and burial at Gore and Gore automatically, and maybe Charmaine, you could inform folks about what is Gore and why Denise, you know, using that title, you know, um, automatically makes the subject of this work, not just an abstract grid-like architecture, but a di direct uh, uh, reference to um, the uh, transatlantic slave trade. Actually, um, um, Gaetan, I'm not familiar with the term Gore. Can you enlighten me on that? Yeah, so Gore is a place. It's okay. an island where there was one of those. Um, oh, the fortress. Oh, the yeah, fortress. Oh. You know, the closed yeah. coast. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Where mm -hmm. uh, enslaved people were brought, you know, to the coast mm -hmm. and trapped there and mm -hmm. then uh, shipped out, you mm -hmm. know? It wasn't. No, those main ports, but uh, what's interesting in Denise's work is she she traveled to all of these places at one point mm -hmm. and heavily documented these places. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, when you look at her work, there's, there's works that are called jail that resemble exactly this work mm -hmm. and work like this, which, you know, talks about the, the confinement of the black body, you know, within the entrapment of uh, the the la cale du bateau I forget how you say that in English but the the the, the cargo hold the cargo hold right exactly the mm -hmm. cargo hold of a boat and when you're in in when when we will all be able to be in front of this work and because of the what one could have seen as um, a difficult architecture of the McMichael in 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 which one would embed such a work, but today our reaction is because of the low ceilings, we felt entrapped inside mm -hmm. of Denise's work, and so mm -hmm. it's, it's I also. I think also we felt um, you were talking a lot, um, 
Charmaine, about people being just, you know, taken out of their context, losing their family, being without kin, therefore being unrooted. And I think one of the things that Gatan and I felt like this is a floor to ceiling picture in our gallery. And it's extremely large. Like we come about halfway up when we stand in front of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps a little more than that is about eight foot something high and, you know, mm -hmm. almost twice as long. And there is the sense of, of vertigo of having, of, of sort of losing your balance and being swept up by something that's sort of cyclonic. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it really does evoke that feeling of losing your groundedness and, and being, yeah. you know, it actually made us feel almost physically sick to look can, at it. Can it's I say really just as, as me looking at it on the screen, I feel that now, cause it makes me feel claustrophobic because there's no way yeah. out of her image. Right. And can I just say, there's a brilliant scholar of transatlantic slavery named Marcus Reidecker who wrote a book, the first and only book to try to grapple with the slave ship as a whole, as opposed to deep studies on individual slave ships. And he mm. talked about recuperating information that in the cargo hold between decks, that typically there'd be about three speed of space or less, so that people when they were under deck, which could be, oh, it's a majority of the time that they're under deck in the, in the weeks long voyage between some place like Nigeria, today Nigeria to let's say Jamaica, um, they could literally not sit up when they're shackled one to another. And then there were the oxygen holes were sometimes not sufficient. So some people were just suffocating to death. And of course you're shackled one to another. So the sense was too that, and what we know is that enslaved people were rarely brought on deck and brought in on deck just above deck strategically to be forcibly exercised so that their muscles wouldn't atrophy. Mm -hmm. And often Europeans would play their music and force enslaved people to dance. So the terminology that emerged was to be danced Mm. Of course. And so, and, and I'm sure for a lot of these Africans, for all of these Africans, it would have been such, uh, you know, first of all, a crushing introduction to European ideas of cultural practice where, where torture became dance for the European. Whereas for the African, of course, their ideas of spirituality and dance were woven together, of religion and dance were woven together, of family and kinship and dance were woven together. So to be forced to dance to the European man's, let's say, fiddle, for, 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 for instance, so that you wouldn't atrophy, your body wouldn't atrophy, would have been just a complete horrific indignity for mm -hmm. these enslaved people too. But they would have been caught in this, you know, Tomasus's web for most of the time on the ship and seeing the light of day very, very little in those weeks long voyages. Yeah, yeah. so you, you really get a feeling when you're in front of this work that you could imagine um, being underneath, you know, and seeing just, not seeing any light or glimmers of light yes. through the openings. Yeah. Shall we move on to the next image? Sure. So this is a, a series of works. We have them installed. We were in there, you know, doing the installation today of works that have this kind of spiraling, spinning feeling to them. And it is a reference. I think she was very interested in the in industrial prison complexes. Mm -hmm. We go to the next uh, slide is called surveillance. Oh, oops, the one after this one. One more. Um, I believe is called surveillance. But if we back up again, the slide now, uh, to the drawing. Um, she was really uh, studying this um, mm. architecture of surveillance, having really begun by looking carefully at, at the architecture of slave ships. She then mm. made this leap between surveillance, confinement, and how these mm. traditions of abuses of black bodies continue in the contemporary world. Sarah, that's so powerful too, because again, to, to this scholar Reidecker, he describes when he says, what is a slave ship? It was a factory that produced the commodity of the slave. You went on a captive, you came off in the Americas a slave. It also was a floating dungeon. It was a floating prison. So this is so, um, you know, on point to what Tom Tomas is, is, is seeing as well. And of course there were treatises written on how to, of course, like naval, how to construct naval architecture, meaning boats and th three massive vessels. And some of them were, sp were specific and peculiar to how to construct the slave ship, right? So we have to understand that there are certain firms then, especially in Europe and places like Canada and the American Northeast, that all they were doing were building merchant ships, which were also doubling as slave ships, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we have to un understand that as well, yeah. And it, it's interesting in what you were saying before, Charmaine, um, 
about the the you know how the plantation was organized you know yes. with that question of surveillance yes you know on top to be able to look below yes. and then and then that totally triggered with me that whole series of works of Denise called surveillance right so right. she starts with the slave ship she thinks of um mm -hmm. you know a vernacular architecture she then looks at you know uh, um cities ghettos you know urban entrapment and then mm -hmm. the, you know um right after when she starts thinking of this piece that she does um at um at the ago a wall uh, painting um it's all about mass incarceration um uh systems prisons and mm -hmm. then we see the the word surveillance coming back and forward and always these panopticon you know this notion of surveillance that mm -hmm. at no time are you safe within mm -hmm. there's no private space and i think also again this grid form that is a repeating uh form in her work mm -hmm. and you have to think of you know not only your physical entrapment but your mental entrapment mm -hmm. and as we often say you know black folks how you know the 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 let's say the conversation that you have with your children at a certain age about how you must behave or how do you behave if the police stops you you know this is something we all go through that conversation with mm -hmm. our parents at a certain age and having to already think that when there's a policeman you know police does not mean security or safety it mm -hmm. means danger and it goes back to what you were talking about the role of the police within tracking the mm -hmm. runaway things. Yes, so. and Gaetan, to your point, uh, my father called me up because, you know, he, he, we talk every day, but he called me up and said, I think it was yesterday, he said, Charmaine, I cannot believe it. The, the, the mighty, the magnificent Robert Nesta Marley has been dead for 40 years. And what you made me think of when you're talking about mentality in his, uh, his really powerful, one of his many very powerful songs, Redemption Song, while Marley sings, emancipate yourself from mental slavery, mm -hmm. right? None but ourselves can free our minds, right? But part of this too, is when you think about, you know, go back to the architecture of the, the plantation with the house on the hill, what were they banking on? What did they know would happen? you make people feel like they're being watched all the time. And eventually you don't have to watch them anymore. They'll watch themselves and watch each other. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be on the horse with the whip in your hand. You, they will stay because they think you're on the horse with the whip in the hand, right, Sarah? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. If you go to the next um, slide too, there's a, a way in which Tomaso Zen comes to understand them. these, you know, these architectural shapes suggest kind of, um, loading docks and shipping containers and so on. And they certainly suggest to me kind of, you know, um, humans trafficking and people making difficult entry between different, you know, uh, parts of the world, um, human cargo. Uh, so there's like, again, you know, and then this overlooking kind of a tower on the left-hand side that seems to be in a different kind of condition than the one architecturally across the bottom. But you know, what's really, what Gaetan and I ended up talking about in the, in the essay for the catalog that we published is this, you know, our, our, our interview is called Floating Worlds because nothing is ever rooted in the ground with Tomasos. Everything is always mm -hmm. provisional and kind of hanging in space in a way that is not kind of fixed. And I think that really speaks, Charmaine, to this condition of being like, you know, at the mercy of wherever you're going to be sent or not being rooted with family or kin in any, in any, I can't remember that phrase. It was um, that you used of like could be continu continuously in a kind of suspended state of certainty. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, wanted, radical, you know, radical uncertainty. Right, radical right, uncertainty. right, right, right. You know, that yeah. sort of seems like a good um, title for an exhibition um, of mm -hmm. Denise Masso. So I, mean, I kind of wish we'd found that. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. uh, but you know that is really to me that radical uncertainty the way things are sketched and resketched and and the way things are always sort of shuddering and changing into mm -hmm. the next state of being that that radical uncertainty seems to me to be precisely what these pictures mm -hmm. are about mm -hmm. and i i like um you know and it, people would know that i'm the least familiar amongst us of uh with her work but what's so resonating with me too is the way it's making me feel which is not yeah. good but which is, which is exactly, I understand what she wants to elicit. But part of that too is making me think back to Sarah's point 
if you know when I when I do this work on slavery, I keep coming back and back to the, this this point of you know today we use the term post traumatic stress disorder a, a lot, but I mm -hmm. think when I think of enslaved people, I think there was no post about it. You were constantly in a state of traumatic stress. You never got to be post your traumatic stress because it was yeah. ongoing. And again, to go back to Andrew with his for, supposedly forged passes, that is telling us, and we know from other sources that. Listen, any white person, slave owner or not, thought they could stop, harass, manhandle any black person who they suspected of being an enslaved person because of that racial hierarchy and white, the function of white superiority. So what did that mean for you as a black person, as a black enslaved person who was literally under that, the colonial law of your region considered to be a thing? What types of harm did that open up for you? Not just from your you know, discreet slave owner, but from anybody who felt mm -hmm. they wanted to try it with you that day. Yes. You know, and of course, self-defense is something that you, you undertook as enslaved person at your peril, mm -hmm. right? Because built into the code, code noir, for instance, the governing, you know, slave code of the French empire was that you were to be executed as an enslaved person if you drew the blood of a slave master, right? So, what did that look like? You, it was also written into these laws that you were basically not allowed to defend yourself as an enslaved person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you take us to the next slide, Sherman? And again, thank you for doing such an expert job at getting us from A to B. We did have this very elaborate plan to share the clicker and be able to go back and forth, but we realized that we'd hit the wall of our technological savvy. <laughs> Sherman has left in to help us. So Odyssey, so this is a work that we're just bringing into um, the McMichaels collection. Thank you to uh, Andrew and Christine Dunn who have acquired it for us as a promised gift. And you know, the thing that I do find kind of extraordinary about this painting in Gaytown, I don't know how you feel about it, but is this sweep, this sweeping form up to the top right. And that, that shape persists again and again in Tomaso's paintings, in, whether they're tiny works, or their great big, you know, symphonic works like this one. And to me, it, I don't know what you see in it, but to me, it's about going somewhere, going to a new place. It has it's, this incredible sense of movement about it. And I'm just curious how you, how you see this. What do you think Denise is, is telling us here? I think, you know, like the title Odyssey, you know, just says it. And then I think what I find extraordinary, the more I del del uh, dive into these works, is that if we think of what Charmaine was telling us about human cargo, about capitalism, about production, about merchandise, when we look at this work, the first thing we think is like, yeah, we're in a port, are those containers? So the, the reference to merchandise, things that are movable goods, and the reference to humans as movable goods and mm -hmm. not knowing what's inside of these things. And are those, are those um, I, I, I think in, in, uh, if we look at the date of this work, 2011, she passed away in 2012. So this expansion of her thought process to jails, but then to talk about refugees, right? Refugees that we find in ports, that we find hidden in cargo ships, you know? So we are, we keep repeating because people who flee their country, first of all, have to pay passage mm -hmm. and then they're reduced to being cargo hidden. Mm -hmm. And then when revealed, you know, there's horrific stories of what happens to refugees on boats on those cargo ships. So, mm -hmm. but there is that notion of movement, you know, that instability of the black body, um, you know, and, and then one thing that's really important in Denise's work is after she finished her, uh, her BA in Toronto, like while she was doing that work, a lot of her work was around coffins, uh, was around, you know, very political work where the black body was physically drawn, present, figurative. But then she goes to Yale and when she exits Yale, she removes the black body it's become it, her works is very is very um i would never say that her work is not abstract it's very conceptual where everything she does with every stroke of her her body she's embodying the presence of those bodies that she has decided to remove but are signified 
through every brushstroke. And when you're in the front of those works, and if you think of everything that we've just said about the plight of the enslaved, you know, and you're in front of this work, it becomes visceral. You're being, it's as if we are taking that journey time and time again throughout her works. And, you know, I never get tired of looking at these works and delving in. And I think Charmaine's perspective from this, this notion of cargo, this notion of appropriation, this notion of objectification, you know, and the capital that these people um, represent is really, this work, Odyssey, to me, is a great example of how that can be symbolized through these shapes and forms. Mm -hmm. But it also has this extraordinary sense of momentum. And I think this picture is very mm -hmm. different than Gore Island, which is kind of this house of mirrors that you can't escape. This to me has a, a kind of a direction. And there's, if you show us, Charmaine, the next sure. and final slide, you know, this shape again here, you know, mm -hmm. everything's sweeping mm -hmm. up to the upper right corner. This is an absolutely exquisite little picture. It's one of the last works that was in her studio when, when she died. Um, so it, it, it's kind of a nice, um, place for us to to wind up as we wait to to get some questions from our audience, mm -hmm. but you know I do find it is literally an uplift at the upper right. There's a sense of momentum and driving upwards. A number of people on the chat have said it looks like a boat to me. It looks like yes, like yes. I was just going to say that it looks like the tip of a boat. Yeah, but I think also one thing we must all think mm -hmm. is that Denise was a very positive person, right? So mm -hmm. she's talking to us about these very difficult subjects, but in her brushstrokes, in the colors that she uses, there is a sense of hope, right? There's an opening. There's we're not we're no longer in the the uh, in the cargo of the boat. We're we're rising up. You know, we see an horizon that is not being shown to us. But there's a sense of movement that is like the the images or the structures are opening themselves up. And I think that that also, when one knew the artist, very positive, dynamic, focused human being. Mm -hmm. Like most black people, what I always tell to white people, you underestimate our capacity to survive anything. And whenever I feel bad about myself, I think yeah. of the slave boat and I'm like, it ain't that bad, you know, onward and forward. And that the underestimation of the capacity of these Africans to survive these terrible things and yet survive and try to thrive and still have the, the, the force, and we've seen it with the Black Lives Matter protests, this force to keep fighting for this freedom that keeps being you know, um, something that people still question whether we are allowed to be on the same level as white European. And it's an ingrained thing that has been embedded in people's minds the way Charmaine was, was talking about, like 400 years of that gets passed along to generation of white Europeans, you know? Um, so we have, to, we have to use art and our institutions to do better, to have these types of conversations like we're having today, because that's what you know, that's what artists do. And that's why an artist like Denise is just so fabulous. Mm -hmm. So Jen, are you, ah, well said Gaetan, says Kenneth Monty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being with us, Ken. Um, Jen, perhaps there are some questions that people want to. Uh, sure, and you know what, have. do you want me to stop sharing so that they can see no, it I better? I think we should look at this beautiful painting. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Because it's just the sheer force of it is so sort of Can I say one thing, Sarah, which I think is really important? Yeah. Often people forget that art history is about art and history. And Charmaine has proven to us today how her deep dive into visual history and where she has been looking, you know. And bringing that next to Denise's work, we we all are richer in our understanding of her work, you know, without having her present, but through the work of an historian like Charmaine, we understand how this visual culture is also a place where we can dig d uh, deeply to understand the society in which we're embedded. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Kitan, I'm glad you said that um, because I, I said off the top that we would be, you know, talking about harm and suffering, um, but also that we would be uplifted by the caliber and, and creative engagement uh, that is going on today in this difficult topic. And I, I don't know. I think I may have understated uh, the former and overpromised a bit on the latter, but I think you got right to that piece that is uplifting about how, uh, you know, a. Um, an investigation of Denise's work can allow us to get at things that uh, we might have got at otherwise, and, and we can be really grateful um, for that. I, I'm feeling that um, after this time we've spent together. Um, I, before we get to questions for um, Dr. Charmaine Nelson, uh, someone asked um, if uh, Sarah and Gaetan could give just a bit of background about Denise Tomasos because uh, not everyone uh, on, on our uh, seminar is familiar with her work. And um, so might one of you just say a bit about her biography? Gaetan, do you wanna do the honors? Sure, Sarah. So uh, Denise Tomasus was a Trinidadian-born Canadian uh, painter. And um, so she was, uh, at eight years old, she moved with her family from Trinidad to Toronto. And then she studied at the uh, University of Tor Toronto and then um, did her uh, BA, BFA there. Um, and, um, and then went to Yale. Uh, did her MFA at Yale. Then she taught at Tyler um, 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 School of Art in Philadelphia, and then was a professor at Rutgers University, and um, and was a painter, uh, a painter who, you know, dedicated. Like when you speak to her mother, her her sibling, she always wanted to be a painter. This is what she wanted to do, and she wanted to have a career, and she wanted to. Also, teaching was very important to her, and. Um, she had two galleries. She had one gallery, Linen Weinberg in New York, and she had the great Olga Korper Gallery in Toronto. And um, she won so many awards, like Guggenheim Fellowship, Pew Fellowship. I mean, you know, she was uh, an accomplished artist and um, she died too soon in 2012. And I must say that I miss her every day. And, um, and she was really an extraordinary artist who was really her work, uh, as I've mentioned, if you want to understand her work, what we've talked about, so abstract uh, work, um, the grid is a recurring architectural form that you will see throughout her career. And, um, and also this idea that from the architecture of slave ship to the architectures of city dwellings to vernacular architecture that are found in Trinidad, in, um, in India, in China, um, in um, Western Africa. And then the last part, a deep interest in, um, in um, prison, you know, massive uh, industrialized prison system. And this notion of entrapment of the black body, which is weaved in different narratives. So Sarah, is, am I missing anything? No, I think you've really covered it. And it's really this interested, this interest that she has in architectural structure, but also social structures. Like what are the things that organize us? What are the structures of thought that organize us as well as the architectural structures that have contain or could potentially uh, liberate us? You know, I think, I think that she kind of contemplates both at various times in the career. And she died, um, I should say she died of a very routine, it was a freakish accident. She died of a very routine, in a very routine uh, medical test mm -hmm. um, and just was vanished. And it was just this enormous shock for, for so many of us in the art community that respected her so much. So, um, you know, it's just been a marvelous privilege to, to open the work up again. We've had uh, in the Q&A um, a few questions, but more than questions, loads of expressions of appreciation um, for uh, this conversation. Um, Charmaine, you talked about this um, a little bit, but I, I think it's worth revisiting. <laughs> What do you think, you know, if you can point to a few kind of key pieces, uh, key sources of the kind of Canadian naivete about transatlantic slavery and, and what you think we can do to dismantle that naivete in the, in the short, medium and long term? 
Right. Thank you for that so much, Jennifer. Um, well, from my own experience, I'm now at NASCAD University in Halifax, but I taught at McGill for 17 years and I routinely taught a class that I call the visual culture of slavery and uh, typically had 60 to 100 students and usually about 75% Canadian. So I'd always on the first day say to everybody, and I should say, by the way, uh, uh, then another 15 to 20% American students and the rest from elsewhere. But I'd ask them on the first day, how many of you come to my class knowing that slavery happened in Canada? And across the 17 years, I had one student say yes. And what they told me about though, was that they had been schooled in the Underground Railroad since grade two. So let's just pause and think about that. So again, we're teaching from elementary school the 30 year history that makes us look and feel good. And the students knew nothing about Canadian slavery. And not just that, they didn't know it had existed. And when I finally got to that student who said, yes, that one student, I said, oh, would you please? I was happy. I said, would you please? <laughs> would you please? And I was like, yes. Would you please share with us the content that your teacher had, has, had imparted to you? And they said, there was no content. There was one line, Canadian slavery happened. And then they went on to teach us about a tropical location of plantation slavery. I was like, of course they did. And it's not the teacher's fault. I've been hearing from a lot of teachers now um, because I recently founded the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery at NASCAD. And so the teachers are reaching out to me saying, help us, we want to teach slavery. We want to teach Canadian slavery. We don't know how. And of course, you cannot teach. How can you teach what you've never studied, what you've never had the opportunity to learn? So curriculum reform is high on my list of things to accomplish. And to your other question, Jennifer, I think Part of why the Institute is so important at NASCAD is because it's an art and design university. And, and, and why I say that, if you think of, you know, for the audience and for myself, how did most of us learn about slavery? Through a film or several films, right? Lately, we're lucky. We've had some good ones, 12 Years a Slave, Django Unchained, Lincoln, et cetera. But prior to that, there were nostalgic rubbish, really, I'm sorry, but like Gone with the Wind is not accurate at all, right? People love the film for other reasons, but please don't love it because it's depicting slavery in a realistic manner because it's not, okay? So what is my point? Film then is one method through which to teach people about their history. And it's particularly important for slavery because um, most people will never crack open an academic book. And I understand why you don't wanna do that, but also you might not pick up even the novel or the nonfiction book that's a trade book on slavery, but you will watch 12 Years a Slave. So why it's so important too, in terms of the teaching of Canadian slavery is that there's still no documentary or narrative film on Canadian slavery. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something I'm hoping to, to have the artist in residence money and the fellowships for the filmmaker to come and be the first to produce the, those types of films that will help us on this path, because I think Canadians are ready to do this hard work, but we need, um, we need to build the curriculum and build the different um, sources of knowledge that are accessible to a broad uh, cross-section of the Canadian population. And Charmaine, you were telling us the other day when we, when we were talking about a CBC series yes. that you recommended. Can you tell us about that? And also I think about yes. the new series that I think is coming on stream on Friday. Uh, With the Barry Jenkins. The Dunham, right, novel, right. underground railroad that's been turned into a, into a into a television series as well for sure so the one i'm more equipped to talk about in because i've screened um most of it now is there's a six-part docu-series called enslave that was uh, produced in part i believe by the cbc or at least it aired in in cbc in canada and really, I have to say, it is really a brilliantly well-made uh, and historically accurate depiction of slavery, the, the, uh, uh, transatlantic slavery. Sadly, they don't focus on Canada, which is typical, right? Um, but um, they really take you through to the things I tried to introduce to you, like what do we as scholars actually look at when we're trying to do this research, the manuscripts, the printed documents, the art. And of course, what makes this docu-series extraordinary is they focus on the 2 million enslaved Africans who died at sea, mm -hmm. who were put on the slave ships and never made it off. So they're looking at a lot of sunken slave ships and trying to recuperate those either by bringing them up or bringing up the artifacts after they locate them. Locate them. So what is extraordinary too, even for me as a specialist, 
is to see another subset specialization of transatlantic slavery studies where you have the underwater archaeologists and people yes. who are studying the marine histories of slavery, right? The experts in the nature of the slave ship, et cetera. So that is a brilliant documentary. And I believe it's available online right now on the it's CBC on, website. Charmaine, it's on CBC Gem. And I watched okay. the first one last night on your recommendation and uh, I was riveted and I will be watching another one tonight probably. It's on CBC Gem and it's very, very good. Fantastic. There's, a, there's another series that um, I would recommend to everyone which gives us like a great understanding of why, you know, why uh, the uh, slavery in the Americas, uh, which is a uh, title Exterminate All the Brutes. And it's by um, Haitian filmmaker, Raoul Peck. So many of you will have heard his name. Um, he, um, he, he did um, I'm Not Your Negro. And he said that after having done I'm Not Your Negro, uh, Europeans were saying, we don't understand, you know, racism in America. Why racism in America? Mm -hmm. And basically this four part documentary is like racism in America is came from Europeans, right? And, but they seem to have forgotten their role in uh, slavery. And mm -hmm. when you look at Raul's uh, uh, four part documentary, you understand that um, North America or um, the Americas, that project is about, um, you know, accessing free land, which means extermination of indigenous population, stealing of the land, mm -hmm. and then bringing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, people over mm -hmm. who have access to quote unquote free land, and then bringing the enslaved to have mm -hmm. free labor in mm -hmm. order to have capital and revenue. So- but Gaetan, can I just jump in and say how extraordinarily offensive it is that Europeans pretend that this is not their history? And I'm like, how can we just pause it for a minute and think, how do they pull this off? You were the empire builders. You were the ones who went into the Americas, who, who stole the indigenous land, right? Occupied uh, territories and actually put set all this in motion. You were the ones who created a colony like Canada that became a nation and a colony like the United States. So how dare you forget? And that speaks to the active nature of forgetting and who feels entitled to be able to erase the fact that these are not just their national histories, but their personal ancestral histories. Something that often um, perturbs me when dealing with Canadian audiences too, is that, um, you know, I'll say, I, I've said to my students when I do this work with them, go home and talk to your grandparents. And if you're lucky, your great grandparents and ask them about if your family has any connection to slavery. And of course, the black kids in the class who are diasporic will also always know, they know with a certainty, you go back a certain amount of generations and you hit enslaved an ancestors, right? But the white students are usually like, what are you talking about? This is not my story. It's like, hello. Who is the slave ship captain? Who is the slave ship crew? Who's the merchant? Who's the auctioneer? Who's the notary, right? Wow. They are all white people. They're all white people and also some abolitionists. But do you really think that when you get back to four, right, the four grandparents, eight, 16, 32, 64, you don't hit anybody who's implicated? Really? Mm -hmm. And I had an extraordinary brave student who came in after asking the question. She said, Professor Nelson, I got to tell you. I said, will you share it with the class? Yes, she said. I went home and asked the question and my parents revealed to me that one of our great, great, great grandfathers was the, the governor of Virginia, my friends. Oh God. And they were just sitting on that. They were not, they just were sitting on it. And she had to ask an explicit question to get that out of them. Wow. And I'm like, you don't get any more implicated in slavery than the governor of Virginia. He would have been a planter and someone who was upholding the, the rights of other whites to enslave black people. Yeah. Right? And it doesn't My, even have to be on that scale, but like, was your ancestor one of the shipmates on a cargo ship, you know, that James McGill owned that he was sending to Jamaica and that person knowingly knew that what they were bringing back was rum, sugar, and molasses harvested by enslaved people and 15 enslaved people on every ship. Mm -hmm. right? So as you say, we're all part of the story. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, directly and indirectly all implicated. I'm telling you, if you're white, if you're black, if you're Asian, if you're indigenous, you're implicated in this story in some way, especially those four groups of people, right? 
Charmaine, could you talk about, um, you know, the relationship with shipbuilding and uh, um, Newfoundland, COD, you know, that triangle between mm -hmm. Newfoundland and uh, the Caribbean and the shipbuilding? Right. So, okay. So I think too, Camille Turner has, in some of her research has revealed yeah. that some of the bases of, of shipbuilding were in Canada as well as, here's the thing, even when the American Northeast, places like Rhode Island, Pennsylvania have, have abolished slavery, they still are making the infrastructure of slavery that keeps the American South, the Caribbean and South America functioning. So they abolish slavery in the American North sooner, but that doesn't mean they go, oh, we're not gonna sell our ships to the slave traders who we know are going to Africa or going to, to Jamaica to enslave people. They, they don't, most of them don't feel that uh, that's their place or, or they understand that that will disrupt their money-making. So they mm -hmm. continue to participate in slavery, even though they're not necessarily slaving themselves anymore. So that's true too of places, especially in the Maritimes in Canada, as well as the wood that was being harvested and sent down and being used for, for these types of enterprises, um, either sent to Europe or sent to the Caribbean, as well as to your point, Gay 10, things like the cod. But what I found that's interesting, most people assume, and I, I don't know how this became kind of slavery, trends like slavery lore that the codfish was being used to feed enslaved people. What I found in my research in Jamaica is that's absolutely not true. Enslaved people were not given codfish. They were given dominantly cheap forms of carbohydrates. And you find that across the Americas that what the enslaved person's diet was were the cheapest forms of carbs in whatever region. American South, that meant things like corn. And in Jamaica, that meant things like yams, plantain, banana, and they were seasoning uh, the Jamaican people's carbohydrates in, in that space with um, herring, so salted or preserved herring. But uh, the descriptions of the amount of her herring, they weren't actually pieces of fish. The herring was used as a sauce to season the carbohydrates. So the, the enslaved people weren't getting near the codfish. That's mm -hmm. actually a myth. The codfish was being used for um, middle and upper class whites. But there was, uh, of course, that traffic of the, sh of the ships with fish and wood and apples and potatoes going down to places like Jamaica. And what came back was coffee, rum, molasses, sugar, and enslaved people on those ships. Mm. Well, Jen, I, I have a feeling, Jen, that you have an eye on the, the clock here. Are we? Well, I do. But I think, Sarah, we, we, um, can we ask just Charmaine to say a little more about the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery before we wrap up? Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer. So I just made the move to, um, to, to Halifax to, to join the faculty at NASCAD University in 2020. And part of what got me to leave McGill after almost two decades was the fact that I was offered the ability to found my own research institute, which is extraordinary. I'm very, very privileged. So what I founded is the Institute for the Study of Canadian Slavery. And the vision is from year to year to have cohorts of scholars, scholars sorry, and artists in residence who will be doing work in four mandate areas that overlap in some capacity with the study of Canadian slavery. So I'm so pleased to announce that um, we are advertising right now for our first cohort that will include two artists in residence and two MA graduate fellows um, who will join us in 2021, 2022 virtually. So please, if you know artists, if you are a grad student, please spread the word. The applications are opened until June 30th. And we hope eventually to add also, um, Jennifer, PhD students and postdoc um, uh, fellows as well. So we hope to be, keep expanding as the years go on. And that's, I hope, where we'll get again that filmmaker who wants mm -hmm. to come and do that work and give us our first film on Canadian slavery as opposed to the Underground Railroad. I can't help but add too uh, that if you're out there and you're a person of means who wants to support the very good work uh, that Charmaine is doing, please don't hold back because you really are breaking down really important barriers in our understanding of our own country and our, as we say, the way in which we're all in the story and we need to move forward to understand our country better and it's it's really complicated history. So I know Thank that- Thank you for that, Sarah. I'm yeah. thrilled Thanks. to have you with us. All of us are thrilled, Charmaine, to have you with us. And Gaytan, thank you again for all your spectacular work that you've done on this exhibition with me. It's just been, it's always such a blast working with you, being with you.
and particularly having with us tonight uh, on our day of triumph when we actually got to install an exhibition after like, a year and a half. <laughs> may I say just a couple more things before we wrap up? Uh, first of all, Charmaine, the existence of your institute is very uplifting. So thank you for telling mm -hmm. us about that and its growth. We will all uh, watch for its growth. Um, I want to say thank you to all of you. We're feeling so grateful um, to Charmaine for uh, sharing her research with us, um, to uh, Denise Tomasos for exploring these difficult topics mm -hmm. um, in her work, and to Gaetan and Sarah for uh, foregrounding that work in an exhibition. We have produced a wonderful publication that goes with this um, exhibition. It is hot off the press just a few days ago. Uh, it is only available through our eShop and it's only $25 and it reproduces um, all of the works in the exhibition in beautiful uh, color with an, es an essay by Essie Edugian, um, who is a writer that many of you will know, uh, a wonderful essay in here and um, um, a kind of interview between Sarah and Gitan about um, Denise Tomasso's career and work. Um, I should also tell you that uh, I'm sure you now have a, a big appetite for Denise Tomasso's work. Do look ahead um, at the AGO is doing a lot of research uh, into Denise Tomasso's career and working toward a major project in the future. So look out for that. Um, we are so proud to be able to offer um, meaningful discussions around the art of Canada and how it intersects with, you know, all kinds of elements of uh, current uh, creative life, uh, free of charge to audiences across Canada and beyond. But if you enjoyed uh, the talk tonight and are moved to join our circle of supporters, I, I hope you uh, might do so on our website. There's all kinds of uh, really easy ways to uh, donate to the McMichael um, and donations of every amount help us to give the art of Canada the world-class treatment that we uh, feel it deserves. Um, and once again, we are looking forward to throwing open our doors at the McMichael um, to welcome you in person uh, just as soon as it's allowed. Please uh, subscribe to our website or check out social media and uh, watch for the announcement of the reopening. Until then, please purchase this book from our eShop um, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you at uh, our next virtual or in-person gathering. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you, you Charmaine, uh, Gitan, Sarah. Thank you again. Bye.